Hi, I'm Christian, and this is an update about what I was up to in August-ish of 2020. Let's get started. First of all, I launched a coding school, which is a thing that I wanted to do for like the last seven years since I started a, uh, or since I since I gave a talk on uh, how to learn to code. So uh, as of right now, you can go to genco.school uh, or school.gen.co, and I will teach you how to code. So that's, uh, that's a cool thing. Next, I'm thinking a lot about this concept of clipping long form content into shorter clips. The Joe Rogan podcast, I think is the most popular English speaking American podcast. And I attribute a lot of that success to this thing that he does where uh, he, he has this YouTube channel of these two hour long interviews and he has the secondary YouTube channel of clips. So the two hour long interview is like, that's an investment. You gotta you gotta sit down and schedule time that you're gonna be watching this two hour, hour interview. But if you see this fun little snappy video of like Miley Cyrus on dealing with the, dealing with the how she's portrayed in the media, or there's a typo in that one. Uh, Miley Cyrus gets honest about drug use sobriety. Four minutes and 23 seconds long. How much more engaging is that video than a two and a half hour long interview with Miley Cyrus? Uh, these videos pop up on your feed and you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll spend two and a half minutes, four and a half minutes on uh, on watching this one little tantalizing clip. And then maybe you watch another one and maybe you watch another one and now that's a lead magnet for your channel and now that's, uh, now that's another lead magnet for watching the full video. It makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I know several people who are sitting on these media vaults of this very long form content that are... Uh, not making full use of the content that I think could be using this strategy uh, and, and making an eclipse. So I'm making a thing. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this is going to turn into yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying it right now. The idea is like you, you enter the link of your video here and then it's this very easy interface to clip it. And then part of this is uh, that there's a pipeline behind it of uh, with, with the minimal number of keystrokes necessary, you can turn it into a clip because the alternative is like, you got to find the video, you got to make sure you have enough hard drive space, you got to import it into Final Cut Pro or iMovie or something else. And then you have to make a new project for each clip and then export it and then you have to re-upload it and then you have to title it. So this is, the idea is like, you say what the URL of the video is and then you, as you're live watching the video, hit two keys for the in and out point of the clip and then you title the clip and then you say done and then it goes off and gets queued up into buffer and gets published to YouTube and, and whatever else. So I'm, I'm excited about that. That's, that's the thing that I'm thinking about for this next month. Uh, additionally, another thing that I'm working on is a video editor for making these types of videos. Uh, specifically the transition between going between like full screen on the screen and a uh, little small on my face is a thing that I've wanted to do that I can't figure out how to do in an aesthetically pleasing way with Final Cut Pro or anything else. <laughs> I'm making a I'm making a video editor that works on uh, <laughs> it's it's a website that goes frame by frame through videos and takes a screenshot at each frame and then I stitch them together. It feels ridiculous, and uh, at times this feels like I'm, I'm down a rabbit hole I shouldn't be down that I'm wasting time. But like, uh, how exciting is that, that I <laughs> that I can make my own uh, video editor? So the, the idea there is like, I, I want to be making more of this type of content. Uh, I uh, I think video is a very engaging medium. I think it's a, it's a great way to, to connect much better. It's very high fidelity. You, you get a lot of information uh, quickly. It's very easily shareable, uh, more so than like an article or a, or a book or something else. Um, and so my, my thinking is if I can if I can grease that pipeline as much as possible, just make it uh, reduce all of the friction between uh, I have an idea for a video and the video is published uh, that that would make it so that my video output was was much more prolific. And there's a lot of there's a lot of types of videos and, and uh, types of projects that I think that would benefit, like, you know, marketing videos and tutorial videos and also things like this of uh, keeping in touch with you uh, so that you can know about my life. Uh, I don't know when the last time we talked in person was, but. I feel like now you're getting a, a little snapshot into my life that you wouldn't have gotten before. Uh, and that's facilitated by uh, lowering the, the the friction barrier as much as possible uh, of me being able to, to produce this type of content. What's next? Oh, I'm thinking a lot about COVID movie nights and uh, different ways to interact with people virtually. Uh, I'm playing a lot of Dominion online and that's going very well, but I'm also thinking about like uh, how do you watch a movie with someone virtually? Because that's a fun experience. You get to talk about the movie and, and uh, do different things. So I, I threw this together. Uh, there's things that I've seen that exist where like if you both have Netflix or if the thing that you want to watch is on YouTube, you can sync the playback together. But what I wanted is like a way that I could have my own videos uh, <laughs> of 
perhaps not. Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, 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 films acquired uh, in a legal gray area uh, type of video player that that would also let me like do audio chatting. Uh, so that's a that's a thing I'm thinking about. If there's a movie you'd like to watch together, uh, hit me up. I think it'd be it'd be fun to test this out. Uh, this is a graph of the number of outstanding uh, starred emails that I have. I practice inbox zero and I, I track it methodically. Uh, so the higher this this blue line is, the more outstanding emails there's something that I need to do something on. Uh, and this goes back to what, uh, 2019, almost a year ago, over a year ago. Uh, so you can see here, I had, oh, so much, so much shit together, uh, over here. And then I sort of like let it get out of the way and then I've been traveling more. So it's, it's gotten out of control and I'm, I'm back down, I'm back down. Uh, all of my emails are done. And so I'd love to be, uh, going into, into more of this sort of a period where it's, where it's further down. Uh, this is great because when I have this cloud over me of uh, there's administrative things that are these very straightforward tasks that I don't want to be doing that uh, I need to be doing, it hinders every other part of my life. I'm, I'm, uh, I have less bandwidth to be able to be creative uh, and that's not fun. So I'm, I'm enjoying this period now for the last several days of like, uh, I'm on top of my stuff. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it figured out. I know what the emails are. Uh, you know, as, as soon as I get an email, I deal with it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a day turnaround time right now. Um, and I'm very angry at the thing that worked in, in this iteration of getting back on top of them was uh, this tactic that I heard recommended by Tony Robbins uh, or Tony, Tony Robinson, Tony Robbins. That's right. Uh, in his book, Awaking the Giant Within, a very old book where he says to, uh, to get yourself to do things, it's really about emotional hacking. It's really about recognizing that the reason that you're not doing things is because of uh, emotional hangups. If like you're feeling negative emotion about the things, so you don't do them. That's why drugs work because drugs are this immediate feedback loop of yeah, you take it, you feel good. So oh, what did we do to get there? Uh, we went down this dark alleyway and uh, paid this sketchy person a bunch of money. All right, let's let's reinforce that. Let's do that again. So Tony Robbins' technique is after you do something that was emotionally painful, like doing customer support emails, what a Pandora's box of uh, potential negative emotions celebrate and i'm so angry that that works of like after i did my customer support emails i ran around my apartment and danced <laughs> like sang a little song to myself and looked at myself in the mirror and was like oh you you did a good job today and the first few times i did it i was like this is ridiculous this is not gonna work and it did <laughs> and i'm so mad uh so that's that's my new that's my new hack for uh getting myself to do things small aside here another thing that i've been uh practicing it's an idea I got from my friend Luke is uh, asking myself at the beginning of the day, what work do I least want to be doing today? And then that inevitably points to the most important work that I can be doing for the day. Uh, and so I feel kind of ashamed about that of like the, the work that I don't want to be doing most uh, is the work that's most important. But that's that's helped me narrow in. I'm like, OK, this, this is the dragon in the room. This is the thing that we, that we have to fight. Uh, and there's been a few days so far where honestly answering that question has led to like Nothing. I'm, I'm on top of my stuff. There's nothing that I there's nothing that I don't want to do today, and there are things that I'm excited about. So it's I, I feel good that I've like cleared up the bandwidth. I'm frustrated that I can't talk more about this project. But uh, Trig is a professional magician who I've been friends with since college. He's one of my best friends, uh, and he is a very progressive magician in that his tricks uh, are very technological. He does a lot of things with like iPads and phones and things. And so in COVID, he's doing a lot of things that need to play well virtually, like on a Zoom call. And uh, he came to me with this idea uh, a month or two ago, and I just became enamored by it, of like the, the complexity of the problem uh, and the, the, the magicalness of the effect after it was pulled off. Uh, and so I've been doing a lot of work on this project, uh, and it has been successful in several performances, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and it was very technically complicated. <laughs> And I'm very proud of it. Uh, and I'm also using this as, a, as an opportunity to explore uh, hiring someone else, doing doing subcontracting, subcontract, so that's going well. Uh, and I wish I could say more, <laughs> and I can't. And uh, if, if you would like to see the thing that I did, if you watch one of Trig's shows, uh, one of the recent ones that he's doing over Zoom, uh, you'll see the trick that I helped create. Uh, that's it. I have been thinking a lot recently about paramotoring. Because how cool is it that humans can just fly in the air like a bird, launching off from a parking lot or something? Uh, I love the the freedom of this and like the the ability, the, the the concept of like anywhere you go, you, you can just have a paramotor in your car and then you take off and you get to explore the place in three dimensions. Oh my gosh, how how amazing is that? 
And I was talking to someone recently, uh, my friend Spencer, who ha- is finishing his private pilot's license, uh, and uh, my other friend Rafi, who is getting her uh, instrument license right now, and found out that to get trained for a private pilot's license is, oh, my my, uh, my aunt uh, Susan also, uh, the, all, all three of them repeated this thing that like to get your private pilot's license, to fly an actual plane, is not that much more expensive than I was thinking it was going to cost to get a paramotoring train. And uh, to to fly an actual plane uh, is so much more practical. Like You can go to a place and you can bring other people, uh, potentially like three other people with a, a little Cessna four-seater plane. Uh, and then another another barrier to this that I thought was, uh, okay, well, I don't want to be buying a plane because what, I'm going to spend like a hundred grand to buy a plane that's, you know, 20 years old. But there are flight clubs that you spend, you know, $60 a month to be a part of, and then you can rent any plane you want for between uh, like like 150 and, and $500 an hour uh, that, you know, split between four people, it starts not feeling as unreasonable. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I think uh, when I'm back in Dallas, uh, I might... I might get a private pilot's license. <laughs> uh, Mesquite Aviation looks like the, the place I'm going to go for. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. We're getting more into personal stuff. Uh, I discovered this podcast uh, called Binge Mode from Luke and Tori's friend Riley. It's a literary analysis going chapter by chapter of all of the Harry Potter books. And oh my gosh, it is so good. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, like 200 hours of content. It goes through sometimes the... The podcast episode about the chapter is longer than the chapter itself, uh, if you're listening to it. And they just tie everything together beautifully, and they talk about, like, thematically and the and the uh, uh, the, the overarching themes and, like, the, the uh, character motivations and, and uh, character arcs and uh, peak, picking apart, like, foreshadowing things. Oh, my gosh, it's, it's so good. Uh, I, I, I feel like I've rediscovered the Harry Potter universe, which just, oh... <laughs> Oh, what a, what an archetype. I was uh, very amused also. Uh, I had heard several stories, including one of my relatives, who did not like the Harry Potter series because uh, they are very religious. They, they have, uh, of most of the people that I heard uh, that were sort of religiously opposed to it, most of them were uh, of a Christian background. And because of like witchcraft and, and it uses magic and, and something, I don't I don't feel like I fully understand the, the rationale behind that. But I found it hilarious because in this analysis of the Harry Potter universe, they lay out very clearly that like J.K. Rowling is a Christian and the Harry Potter series is a biblical allegory that ties in all of the same stuff. It's it's all about uh, redemption and it's all about uh, uh, persecution and and uh self-sacrifice and there's even several arcs of uh uh resurrection uh and, and using resurrection as specifically as a sacrifice to, to uh, redeem your sins uh it's it's all the same stuff uh so i, I found it very uh ironic that christians uh are, are opposed to this uh if, if you disagree with me i would love to hear your thoughts of uh, i'm specifically interested in what is it about the harry potter universe that you feel like is uh, makes it inaccessible to your beliefs. That that uh, what what rules it out as an art form? Uh, I'm I'm curious about that. Uh, another thing I'm thinking about is dating a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> experimenting with a bunch of different apps and different. Uh, ways of exposing myself in a, in a uh, way that would be open to uh, a, a relationship, uh, which I'm, I'm happy with. I think I've uh, spent most of the last decade of my life in long-term relationships, and I think developed a lot of uh, dependencies and developed a lot of uh, psychopathologies of... Uh, habits that that did not lead to a successful relationship. And so I spent the better part of the last year sort of picking that apart and figuring out and, and doing the work on myself. And I feel like I'm, I'm finally at the point where I'm ready to explore what it looks like to uh, be looking for a, a, a long-term partner and trying to figure out like what that looks like and how, how I uh, avoid mistakes that I've make, made in the past of like ways that I've approached the relationship and, and uh, uh, ways that I've selected for a partner. Uh, and so this is one of probably a, a dozen books uh, that I've been reading on the topic. Uh, and this one's particularly interesting to me because it makes the case, it's sort of a, a cross-cultural analysis of the way that, that French and Americans approach dating. 
And I don't know how accurate it is. I haven't, I haven't double checked the, the claims that they're making about French culture, but something that struck me was a framing that they make of French dinner parties as the way that French people meet each other, that it's very social. It's, it's much more communal. It's uh, much lower stakes than sort of the, the American way of dating, which is uh, sort of like a business interview of like you're at dinner and you're across from each other and uh, you know, it's, it's sort of high pressure and high stakes and uh, you're, you're there for a certain amount of time and you're sort of interviewing the other person. Uh, and uh, then there's this whole extra layer of there's this weird social dynamic of like the man usually pays and then uh, is, is there sort of an expectation uh, on top of that. So what's interesting to me is it feels like a, a healthier solution to this is figuring out I got the same uh, similar advice from my friend Stefan, who, who uh, lives in Cambridge, of like, don't date, make friends, and and uh, build a uh, build a community. Um, and so I'm I'm thinking a lot about that topic of like, what what would it look like if instead of you know in a week going on three or four different dates and then sort of the uh, determining at the end of the date that like, uh, all right, this probably isn't gonna work out, and then. Uh, sort of feeling like the the effort that I invested in that person was wasted and now uh, the conversations I have with that person are, uh, you know, probably can't be referenced with them again. Um, what if instead of doing that, I was investing this effort in just building a community and in uh, bringing people together with things like, you know, a virtual movie night. Uh, so that's, and then, you know, in the worst case, <laughs> I've, just, I've just built a better community. Uh, that's, a, that's a thing I'm thinking about. Uh, for this next month, for September, my goals are I'd like to polish off this video editor, uh, an editor that I'm probably going to be pushing forward with uh, this video. <laughs> this video you're watching right now was edited with the video editor that I made. Uh, File Inbox is still my main company that's bringing in most of the revenue. I have an idea for transitioning that over to the serverless architecture that's much more clever and, and scales much better. Uh, and I feel like I have a, an idea of like a graceful transition towards that. So I'd like to take the first step of that this month. Uh, clips marketing is, is my working title for the, uh, Joe Rogan style clips thing. Uh, I would like to launch that to, there's two people I have in mind that I think are going to be able to, to directly use it. Uh, I would like that to happen this month. I would like to publish this video. That's a that was a goal for this month. Uh, and then I have a company that I uh, started in college called Textbooks Please. It's a textbook search engine that I've just been neglecting. That like I haven't touched in, in three years. I think it's broken right now, but I'm not sure. Uh, that as as a further experiment in outsourcing, uh, I would like to pass that off to a to a subcontractor uh, and practice this amazing thing that you can do in the world of like if there's work that you don't want to do you can just hire someone to do it and then even if you don't want to do it you can just be so much more capable of like you can turn money into work and then that buys back more of your time that you can use to hire more people and, and make more money and, and uh oh it's it's very exciting uh that's it that's what i'm thinking about that was my august ish of 2020 uh i'll see you next month for september ish uh goodbye have a good day